evening, everybody, and, and welcome to this is the sixth um, Plays the Way book group. And um, it's actually a little bit different from the others because previously we've um, we've concentrated on a chapter from the book with um, uh, authors and and on the last occasion a guest speaker. But um, this time it's um, our, our publisher um, is going to be one of the speakers um, and. Her, one of her main interests, Carol Craig, who publishes Postcards from Scotland, one of her main interests is children's resilience and the role of play and parenting in both of those. And while that isn't ever a specific focus in uh, Play is the Way, it actually has been an important focus for Upstart because um, as it says in the introduction, we actually began the Upstart campaign because of concern about resilience and children's mental health. And we felt that the decline of pain is contributing to that. So it is a really interesting subject to tackle and we're terrifically lucky because we've got sort of like a basically top woman on this at the moment um, in Professor Carol uh, Helen Dodds from um, the University of Reading. She's a professor of child psychology. Um, she's been the lead researcher in the recently published British Child Children's Play Survey. And she's particularly specializes, we've um, been circulating um, articles on our Twitter and Facebook feeds about adventurous play that, that um, Helen's been involved in. So um, very, very excited to hear what she's got to say on the subject of parenting, play, or play, parenting, and resilience. Um, and um, then we'll come to Carol to uh, put her input in. So I'll hand over to you if I can, Helen. Thank you very much indeed. Great, thank you for that lovely introduction and for inviting me along today. So I was just saying um, to Sue beforehand that there's so much that I could say, and I could talk to you for hours on this topic, um, but I was told five to 10 minutes. So I've picked out a few things that I think are the kind of main points. Um, but really, really happy to, to join the discussion and to answer questions about the British Children's Play Survey, for example. Um, also, I've done some more research about the role of parenting in children's anxiety more broadly, and also happy to talk about that as well. But what I wanted to focus on is this idea of, of the role of adventurous play and why adventurous play is important um, for building resilience. Um, particularly, I'm interested in it in terms of preventing children's anxiety. Um, so, I'm sure many, many of you on the call know that free play, where children choose what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, when they're going to start, when they're going to stop, um, has lots of benefits for children. So in the moment, it's enjoyable, it can help to increase their sense of control, um, it supports relationships, if you, you know, allow the child to lead the play, um, and don't interrupt it unless you're you know, invited to join in. Um, and really importantly, over the past year, I've been doing quite a bit of work kind of advocating for children's need for this kind of play in terms of processing and coping with what the past year and the pandemic has thrown at them because free play helps children to express themselves and to make sense of things and so again this is not going to be the focus of the the rest of what i will talk about but really happy to, to think about how the pandemic can has affected children's kind of emotional well-being and how their play fits in there as well so lots and lots to say about play very generally but specifically um, I want to talk about adventurous play. But first, I want to start by setting the scene somewhat, um, which is a little bit doom and gloom, and I apologise for that half past seven in the evening. But before the pandemic, so this, these data are back from 2017, between 2004 and 2017, we saw a 49% increase in emotional disorders in children aged between five and 15. Um, of those disorders, anxiety disorders are the most common. Um, so anxiety disorders affect lots and lots of uh, children and young people. And anxiety is what we often call um, a gateway disorder, which means that it's one of the first signs of mental health problems that children experience. And lots of children who have an anxiety disorder, if they don't get the right support and help with that, will have longer term negative outcomes. So things like long term mental health problems. So children who are anxious, often become adolescents who are depressed, for example, um, and can then have a lifelong um, anxiety as well. It's also related to things like substance abuse, as well as, as children going to adolescence and into adulthood. Um, so if we want 
to prevent these kind of lifelong mental health problems and children setting off on the wrong trajectory, then anxiety is a really sensible place to start. By preventing anxiety, we might be able to prevent a lifetime of mental health difficulties. And we know from research I've done and lots of research that other fantastic researchers all around the world have done, that these pathways to anxiety begin quite early in life. So I've done research with children from when they were age three up to when they're 16. And we can there are things that we can measure when they're three, which predict anxiety when they're 16. Um, so we know that in, even at the age of three or four years old, some children are starting to go on that trajectory, which increases their risk for anxiety. And so what all of my work and what I'm passionate about is how do we create a society where children are supported as best as possible to not be going on that trajectory? Okay, so preventing children from getting to the point where they have a disorder and they need treatment or therapy, but creating a society for children which supports them and prevents that trajectory as much as it is possible to do so. Um, so lots and lots of different factors related to risk for anxiety. Um, I don't have time to go through them in any detail, but happy to chat about them some more if anyone's got questions. Um, so things like um, not coping in effective ways and not being able, not expecting that you will be able to cope is an early sign of anxiety and related to anxiety. Not being able to cope with uncertainty or what we call intolerance of uncertainty. So sort of needing to know everything, who's going to be there, where are we going to go, what time are we going to get there? That kind of, I need certainty in everything and, in and not being able to cope with uncertainty is a, also a risk factor for anxiety. Anxiety sensitivity or what's called, um, sometimes called like fear of fear, which is when I start to feel a bit anxious or fearful, that really scares me and that makes me even more anxious and fearful and I think that something awful is going to happen. So I'm misinterpreting those butterflies in my tummy or those sweaty palms as meaning that something terrible is happening. Um, and the final thing is avoidance, which is basically means that you know, we all know if you fall off a bike, you need to get back on the bike, right? The worst thing that you can do for anxiety is avoid things that make you feel anxious. Um, so from a parenting perspective, I've done research showing that when parents kind of step in and support a child in avoiding something that makes them feel anxious, then that child is at elevated risk for anxiety over time. So whilst we want to be supportive as parents and to let children know that we're there for them, that we understand that they're, they're worried, they're concerned. Also, to some extent, we need to encourage them to give things a go because if they continue to avoid things, then actually what we're doing is increasing their risk for anxiety. So lots of different factors related to anxiety. The reason for talking about these particular ones is that I think if children complain in an adventurous way, then they get to learn about coping, about uncertainty, about arousal, and they're less likely to be avoidant because it's play and it's fun. So I think that we can target some of these things that we know are related to anxiety over time by giving children ample opportunities to play in an adventurous way. What I mean by adventurous play is exciting or thrilling play where a child experiences a little bit of fear, like, oh, can I jump off this? Is this too high? Is this too fast? And But they're able to take age appropriate risks. So it's not about pushing children to do things that are risky, but it's giving them the space to evaluate the risk for themselves. And when we give kids space, they're actually really good at working out what's too risky and what's not. But if we jump in and we say, no, that's too high or that's too fast, we remove that opportunity for them to work it out for themselves and for them to learn. And then also all the other things that come with that, that those feelings of arousal, they go fast on my bike down the hill. Um, and in that fun context where you're not going to think, oh, when my heart beats really fast, it's awful and it means something terrible is going to happen. It means I'm having fun. It's thrilling. It's exciting. Um, and it's uncertain, but that's OK because it's in a play context. So I think that by giving children these kind of opportunities to play in an adventurous way, we can prevent to some extent some of those things that are related to anxiety. So if you, if you want to think about it as resilience, you're building children who are able to cope, know they can cope, know what it feels like when they feel a bit scared, know that that's OK, know what their heart beating really fast feels like, know what butterflies in their stomach feel like. And none of this stuff is terrifying for them because they've experienced it all through their play. 
So basically, this is my idea that adventure is play can prevent children's risk for anxiety. Um, this paper was published in January. Um, it is freely available. It is a bit of a beast. It's quite long and it might be heavy going. Um, but anyone who's, who's interested in sort of finding out more detail, um, if you just Google the title um, or Google me and Adventures Play, you should be able to find it um, and you can have a read. Oh, we don't need to see that change of colour. So here's just some nice pictures, uh, most of them provided by Lindsay Landscapes of children doing risky play stuff, just so that we're clear what it is that we're talking about, what kind of things they might be doing. Um, so just to sum up, I think adventurous play provides a positive context where children are motivated to engage in situations where they might experience some fear. And in doing so, it provides natural exposures and an opportunity to learn about physiological arousals that those like my sweaty palms and my heart racing, about coping, that I can cope, that I know how to cope, that I can make decisions for myself and about uncertainty. I'm exposed to uncertainty. I know how it feels to feel uncertain. I'm not scared of it. Um, and then I just, I really like these quotes. These are from children from a um, qualitative study, just to show that this isn't just me thinking that this is what children want to do, but actually children really like doing it as well. And they identify with these feelings of exciting, thrilling play. And um, so this first quote is from a secondary school age boy. And um, said, I did it once and I did okay. And I felt happy and scared at the same time. I couldn't stop myself. And then a secondary school age girl, you feel excited because you're out of your comfort zone, but you're enjoying yourself. And a primary school age boy, I feel free and confident and on top of the world because I'm really high. And this is sometimes described as a scary, funny emotion, but it's scary, but it's happy and it's funny. Um, so that's where I'm going to finish up. I'm really excited about um, having some more discussion about this as we progress. Thank you ever so much, um, Helen. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. I've been writing scribbling like mad all the time you've been speaking. Um, so, Carol, um, I'll just quickly introduce Carol. It's difficult when you know someone very well to decide which of the many bits of things you admire about her you can mention. But uh, Carol's um, the founder and CEO of the Centre for Confidence in Glasgow, which actually now operates as the publisher Postcards for Scotland, which is um, how we come to be working together, but also Carol is on the board of Upstart Scotland. Uh, but she herself is the author of very many books, um, including the, the Scots Crisis of Confidence and um, Hiding in Plain Sight, which is another postcard from Scotland, as indeed is The Golden Mean, which is about this whole subject, particularly the parenting aspect. Um, so another totally different perspective, but I really think this is going to be such an interesting discussion. Can I pass over to you, Carol? Now, I think we've we've heard from Helen, and I think it was a brilliant presentation on the importance of adventurous outdoor play, and particularly for anxiety. I mean, I think that is so important given the figures. And I think Helen has, has been a model of, of, you know, being academic and concise and very relevant. And you're going to get something really quite different from me because I'm not an academic. Um, I once was, but many years ago, I'm not an academic. I'm going to talk more um, as a generalist, I'm not a psychologist, and I'm interested in big cultural changes which affect attitudes and values and our lives, but they're often really quite difficult to measure or to chart. And my, you know, my interest in this is that, you know, Outdoor play has declined, and I think Helen will talk about that play survey, and we can, you know, hear, you know, the, the latest figures in that. But if we just think about the reasons for it, I think we know that traffic's an issue, stranger danger, parents' fear of judgment if they let their children out to play and other people are being critical of them, the rise of computer games and the fact that a lot of kids would quite like to stay in and play their computer games. A culture of safetyism where the most important thing is being safe. I think a lot of adults have that and I think increasingly that's passed on to children. An obsession with and a pursuit of comfort. I think most of us, and I include myself in that, are less hardy than previous generations. And I think that has come up in some of the research that children can tolerate physical discomfort less than, than, than previous generations. But I think that um, 
a particular issue really is that there is now a new approach to child rearing. And when I say new approach, I think we're talking about something that goes back 30, 40 years. But I think what has happened, you know, in the contrast from my generation's upbringing, upbringing which was really quite authoritarian, with a lot of discipline, a lot of smacking, belting, et cetera, et cetera. There is now this new approach to child rearing where there's a big risk aversion and a fear that adults have of children having any negative experiences or emotions and wanting them to avoid adversities at all costs. Now, I became aware of this really through talking to teachers because I was running the Center for Confidence and Wellbeing, um, I was being alerted to some of the problems with um, um, the, what had happened in America with self-esteem. I really started to research it and I talked to teachers a lot about it in Scotland. And basically self-esteem building practices are ones where you think self-esteem is incredibly important for children. And it was presented as a panacea that everything about children's lives would improve if they just had higher self-esteem. And once you start thinking about that, you worry about how the child is feeling in the moment. And so the kind of things, and I'm not, you could read them for yourself. I'm, I'm not gonna go through them. These are the kind of things that you're likely to do um, if you think that it's really important a child is feeling good about him or herself. And the problem about that is it removes anything that is gritty from a child's life because you don't want them to be struggling. You don't want them to feel frustrated. You want them to feel good all the time. So this is why you lavish them with this artificial praise. Now, I mean, I think there is really quite a lot of evidence now that this has been quite damaging for children and America has moved away from it. But it was interesting that, you know, when I spoke to a lot of Scottish teachers, they said, this is how we, this is the trajectory we're on. We're either right down the road that the Americans are on or we're, we're nearly there. I mean, a lot of teachers used to talk about they weren't supposed to get, say anything at all negative or critical in any of the reports. They only had to be positive. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, we should be overly critical, but I think to try and uh, remove competition from older children's lives, for example, you know, I think we have to question why we're doing it. And I think a lot of that is about our own fear of negative emotions and the fact that we've come to believe that they're damaging. Now, we didn't do anything in self-esteem as a center apart from, you know, give some kind of critique of it, but we did do a lot in positive psychology. And although I didn't really like the focus on happiness, there was a big focus on positive emotions in what we were doing and the importance of positive emotions. And, and that I think inevitably leads people to believe that they should be trying to root out negative emotions. Now, I think that it is interesting that some of the people who early on were positive psychologists, and I've just picked two, Todd Kashtan and Robert Biswas Diener, who wrote quite a lot about happiness and positive psychology, have now published two books where they're really retracting a lot of that and saying, actually, if you want to live a full life, you need to experience and welcome negative emotions. That negative emotions actually um, teach us a lot of things, that they galvanize us to do things differently. Um, that, that we shouldn't be ignoring them. We should be welcoming them into our life. Now, we don't want to be overwhelmed by negative emotions, but we don't want to be frightened of them either. And I think that is where we are as a society and have been for some time. And I can remember when I, you know, had all these conversations with teachers, they, they would say, you know, we get uh, letters all the time from parents saying, you know, my child didn't get the lead part in the pantomime, you're being cruel to him um, or her. In fact, I used to get a round of applause from teachers if I said that because they just said this is so difficult for us because they can't all get the lead part in the pantomime or the nativity play. Or they would get letters to say, please don't teach my, try to teach my child French or do gym with them or maths because they're frustrated, they're feeling negative about it, uh, it's too challenging for them, we don't want them to do it. And the teachers would say, look, we understand this, we're parents ourselves, and we can understand these instincts, but we see that it's not good for children. It's really not good for children to try 
and, and root out any kind of experience that is going to be negative for them. And in the, the book that we did a, a few books ago on the golden mean, uh, and Alan McLean, the educational psychologist, is one of the lead, uh, the lead chapter on it, where he's arguing about the importance of both supporting and challenging children. And he says, if you just support them and don't challenge them, it's suffocating, it's, it's demotivating. Whereas if, it, if it's only challenge, and that's what a lot of us did used to have in, 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 in our young lives, but if it's just challenge, it's cruel. And you need some kind of interplay and balance between support and challenge. I think one of the psychologists who kind of gets the importance of struggle um, and frustration in, um, in, in learning is, is Carol Dweck. And I remember her talking about a research project that she was involved in where they were, they were looking, they were um, observing parents or, or parental sort of caregiver figures with children who were building tower blocks and doing that kind of thing. And what they discovered is that the parents that said, oh, you're a really clever boy, that's great, that's fantastic what you're doing. These children did not develop as well as the children whose parents or caregivers were, were giving them feedbacks about struggle. Oh, that's a hard thing to do. That's a struggle to do it. You know, why don't you persevere with that? This, these were the kind of messages that actually were better for learning than the ones that were just saying, you're really clever, well done. Um, I, I was very, I mean, I'm a great fan of the, the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme. And it's very clear with that, that actually the kids will, you know, if you ever meet them out on a walk on their expedition, they'll moan like hell. We've been up since four o'clock in the morning. I've got blisters on my feet. This is miserable or whatever. Ask the kids at the end, of the reward scheme, what they enjoyed most or what they found most satisfying, and it will be the expedition. Because actually most things that are satisfying are challenging. So if we remove challenge from children's lives, we actually then are demotivating them. That's, that's the point that Alan McLean is making. We need challenge for a sense of satisfaction. Um, sorry, if we go on. Um, so, I think what's happening with this, this, this desire to um, wrap our kids in cotton wool, to use a kind of well-worn cliche, but not for them to experience negative emotions, it's leading to a loss of resilience. That was certainly the feedback that I got from a lot of teachers that I spoke to. Now, what that means is it's, it's losing the ability to bounce back after adversity, a difficulty coping with failure, setback, criticism, conflict, the stuff of life, actually, You're, we're not preparing them for, for the world as it is. Um, you know, we're aware of the hygiene hypothesis that we know that if children grow up in too clean an environment, it can not um, provoke their immune system to, to work properly. And therefore, they're maybe more likely to get allergies and so on. And I think there's something equivalent here going on, that it's as if we're trying to bring children up in too clean a psychological environment where they're only going to experience good feelings. Now, I'm not criticizing parents for this. I was one of these parents. I can remember when my son was born, and he's nearly 40 now, I resolved that he wasn't going to cry. I mean, it's mad, I know, but you know, I think that's because I had a very difficult childhood. I didn't want, did not want him to experience the pain of my childhood. And I think that that is behind, we've gone from, you know, quite difficult way of bringing up children to the opposite of it, where we want to feather better children, but it's actually undermining them. And actually, I think provoking that anxiety that Helen so eloquently talked about. Um, so we're not preparing children for the world as it is. I think we can see this loss of resilience in students. Um, this is a book that came out um, by Jonathan Haidt, who's quite a famous psychologist in America. I can't remember what the other guy does, called The Coddling of the American Mind about students in America. And the demand for trigger warnings has been one of them, you know, so that they don't want to have to read any material that might have emotionally challenging material in it. But as Helen said, trying to avoid things that make you feel anxious, just make it worse for you. 
And there's research that says trigger warnings don't work. And if you think this is just America, Aberdeenshire, Aber University of Aberdeen students recently passed a motion saying they wanted trigger warnings in their courses for anything that they might find challenging in the literature that they were being asked to read. So I think we need to provide both support and challenge. And I think play is the way. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, that was the challenge bit. Um, can I, I can I go straight back to to, to Helen to, to have any comments you've got on on um, on what, what Carol is saying there? Yeah, thank you, Carol. That's, that's a fantastic presentation and picked up on so many things that I totally agree with. And I think you know it's really about finding that place in the middle isn't it where we're not being too challenging but we're not being too mollycoddling for want of a better word yeah. you know we see this in in parenting research with almost any kind of parenting that we look at so if we were looking at sort of negativity in parenting actually the parents who were really really warm with their children that's also not great you know, it, it feels suffocating and, and we yeah. observe parents and we, we, we can pick out, you know, when parents are being negative, clearly that has a negative effect on the children. Authoritative okay. parenting is authoritative, is, parenting. authoritative parenting comes out best for children and that's clear rules and boundaries, uh, but supportive and loving and child centred. Whereas I think that an awful lot of parents have gone, for, and I, I saw it when I was an assertiveness trainer, and I, the number of people that said, you know, I, I hated school, I was treated badly by teachers, my parents didn't love me enough, or they didn't tell me they loved me. I'm not going to be like that with my children. And what they've done is they've gone to the other extreme, where they're indulgent to their children. They don't say no. Um, you know, and that can be a problem as well. I mean, I'm not saying it's better, it's better than the authoritarian, but on the other hand, it comes with its own problems and it's getting that balance. But I think there is something about public policy or, or culture change that has that going from one extreme to another. I mean, I spoke to someone only a few days ago who's very senior in public health, and, uh, but mental health in particular, and he feels that that's now happened with, with, with mental health. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we, we've gone from the stiff upper lip, no one talks about it, to the, to the other extreme. And that is also generating a lot of problems so that people think if they're unhappy, that they're depressed, that they've got a mental disorder. And, you know, and I, I don't know what the answer to it is, but I think it's very difficult, I think, to get that golden mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I was in a meeting last week where we were talking about exactly that. Um, a paediatrician was saying that, you know, the parents turn up with children now very, very concerned about their children. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with the children. You yeah. know? And yeah. he's been a paediatrician for a long time. And he said that that's just changed over the time that he's been a paediatrician. Um, and yeah, and I, I agree with mental health as well, that, you know, we should we be calling it for example, you know, think about the pandemic and the effect that that's had on people. If you're stuck at home and you've lost your job and everything feels awful, should we be calling it depression? Or is that actually right. a normal negative yeah. reaction yes. to what yeah. is a rubbish situation? Yeah. Um, and how do we support those people? Um, and should we be treating them in the same way as we treat somebody who's depressed? Or actually for those people is what they need in terms of support quite different? Um, yeah, I, and I think one of the things I was thinking about as I was listening to you speak was how this kind of passes from one generation to the next. So how the way that we parent might be a kind of reflexive response to, to yeah. parent in the opposite way to how we were parented. Um, and then now what's happening? So if these, this generation of children are growing up, how will they go on to parent as a result so it's almost like when we're thinking about parenting, we, if we want to make a change, we probably actually need to start about 10 years before they become parents. <laughs> I mean, do you know what I mean? It feels like it kind of takes a whole generation almost to change. Actually changing parenting, once somebody is, you know, in that role and has a parenting style is a very, very difficult thing to do. 
Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we, hasn't been mentioned that I think is relevant is the birth of parenting books um, and the idea that there was there is a way to do parenting. Um, and my understanding is that you know when when I was a baby, um, there was maybe one book and everyone read that book and that was it. But now you know you could find a book on almost telling you that any type of parenting is the best way and another type is the worst way. Yeah. And that creates this idea that it's almost like a professionalization of parenting. That there's a way that I can do this right and there's a way that I can do it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I must, must do it this way rather than relying on, you know, support from a wider community and your instincts. Um, and, and so, and I think there's, there is a lot of judgment that parents feel now in terms of, am I getting it right? Do other people think I'm a bad parent? Um, mm -hmm. Which I think, potentially is tied in with that idea that there's a way of doing it right and therefore a way of doing it wrong um and there is of course a way of doing parenting wrong but it's quite extreme yeah, yeah. and yeah. the risk is that we go too much to the yeah to, to and the other thing is children are different They're, i mean i don't think there's a standard because i think children vary a lot and and you know what would be the best type of parent for them will vary absolutely I think. Can yeah. I ask both of you? I mean, one of them, I have a real bugbear about the word parenting. Actually. Yes, I know. Um, I, I, I think it's 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 a word that lent itself very very easily to a parenting industry in yes. the '90s when it started to emerge on the scene, because we previously talked about raising children or bringing children up, and the famous you know, it takes a village to raise a child. There was a much more st yeah. stronger feeling that lots of adults were involved here. And indeed the whole parenting things puts this whole burden on these poor two people. Yeah. And very often poor one person. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, um, that's a, a social thing that's arisen really over the last 20 years. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. Yeah, I agree as well. And I think partly that is to do with this, yeah, sort of it, that it's become an industry. People make money out of it. Um, mm. But it's also, I would say, connected to how we live our lives. That, you know, if your parents live, your, you know, if my parents live 100 miles away, then they're less able to be in my children's lives day to day and to be supporting mm. the decisions that I make. And, and our villages, often don't exist now or they're much smaller than they were in terms you know the village that's raising the child I mean not actual villages um and and that puts a lot of pressure on individuals um and then you know linked into what I was saying and I think I noticed in one of the comments as well that that then leads to parents feeling anxious because they've got to make all the decisions it's all on them it feels like it's high stakes because they could clearly get it wrong and other people are judging you for it and when parents are anxious, they respond by keeping their child more safe. Mm -hmm. um, and that, even when that is actually counterintuitive to what the child needs in the long term, if I keep them safe today, then that relieves some of my anxiety today. You know, if you're lying on the sofa having a cuddle, then you know your child is safe and you feel like you're being a good parent. If you let your child go and explore the neighborhood by themselves and you don't know where they are, you don't don't know that you're being a good parent it makes you feel really anxious even though actually that child probably has much more opportunity to be learning important skills that they need for later um, and probably is having a better time you don't feel good because you're anxious about where your child is and about whether you're doing something wrong and what other people are going to think of that mm. this brings us back actually to the whole raison d'etre of upstart and a lot of the philosophy behind the book plays the way in a we felt that, you know, it, it's all got very difficult. Parents can't let their kids out to play. All these judgments and all the anxiety and all the rest of it. So if that's something so, so much has gone wrong with childhood, really it's up to universal state services to step in and try and do something about that. And where you see the highest levels of well-being um, in terms of childhood are the Nordic countries with the outdoor kindergartens where, you know, for between the ages of three and seven or so, kids are spending their time outdoors with caring adults and they can get on with it and do the play, the adventurous play and get all those experiences. Um, I wonder if Suzanne is around because we're moving into her territory a bit as well. And I, I saw she was contributing to the, to the, to the chat. Um, 
because the other bit that's really important from what I've read about resilience, as well as having these, the challenge, is the security of attachment, mm -hmm. um, of secure attachment. And um, that's one of the things Suzanne wrote about in our book. Uh, that's true, Sue. It's fabulous to hear both of the other speakers tonight. I think of attachment fitting in tonight as being the high support bit. Mm -hmm. So if you have a safe place that you can always get back to, if it gets too risky, you have a safe base, then you're better able to take those risks. Okay. Uh, and that thinking about the idea that it is scary for parents to let children take their risks, to, to do the circle of security bit, which mm -hmm. it talked about sometimes so you come back to one end of an oval and then you go out to take risks and take steps what happens if you're too scared as a child to do that because your safe base isn't safe enough but what happens if the parents who are the safe base are scared to let you do that so it's just another way of thinking about what we're doing tonight what we're talking about but it becomes so fascinating to think, right, so what we're talking about is the biology of child development. And our society just does not think about child development through this biological lens. How do you help people mm. to think more about that so that we can shift the kinds of decisions we make in the moment? Like, will I get off the couch with a, from, with a cuddle? And also how we pay more attention to our own biology so that we can deal with our own anxiety differently as parents rather than holding our children tighter. So mm -hmm. there are, you know, there are lots of themes in there. I would love to know from both our, our speakers tonight, um, what, how do you think we help parents to become braver? What do we do to address this current state that we're in at the moment? Well, I don't even think there's an acknowledgement of it. I mean, that's partly why I wanted to talk about it, because I, do, I don't think that we're really saying that we're really frightened of negative emotions and bad experiences of any kind. Um, and we need to get over this because it's actually driving a lot of the problems that, that we have. I mean, I was also interested that The Guardian um, on Monday, the 29th of April, has a piece about a project that's been set up, I'm not I can't remember where it is, called Rome. And it's precisely to help children, just to help parents allow their children to go outside and play outside. So it's super semi-supervised with some rules, and it's just helping that transition for the anxious parent to allow their parent to do it. Helen, do you know anything about it? Yeah, I do. Um, they are based in Birmingham in a public park. Um, and they basically kids go there and kind of they're going to roam. I uh -huh. Possibly they know, I think they know which children are there. And there are some very simple rules, something like they have to remain in a group of at least three. Yeah. Um, and they have to, they're not allowed to leave the park. Um, mm -hmm. And by park, I don't mean the playground, I mean like a big green mm -hmm. area with wild spaces and stuff yeah. um and another one other thing which is i think like if they hear the whistle or something then they have to come back but yeah. otherwise they're allowed to just go yeah. and it's a public park it's open to the public um whilst they're doing their sessions so it's not like you know mm -hmm. play session in a safe space so to speak um, but it's to give the children yeah opportunity to roam around within the park and to go and you know they make dens and they climb trees and they play in the stream uh -huh. uh, without adult supervision and then they usually have two adults who just walk around yeah just with a slight ear out on you know where are they and mm -hmm. whatever what what what, a, what age group is it helen uh that's a good question I, they they do various different programs i think their open roam thing might be from seven but I'm, guess, I'm guessing. Well, they're saying there's older and younger children and they're making the point about the older children taking responsibility for the younger yeah. one. But they're yeah. saying that the demand is phenomenal and that they just opened it and it was full, you know, right away. There's yeah. a lot. And I think it's just a good way for parents to, you know, deal with their fears and anxiety around it. Yeah. Uh, it's a good transition, I think, for for. So I'll, I'll send round to the upstart people. Um, 
where where it is in the Guardian, and they they then did a a, a leader on it, being very supportive of it. Well, the Guard, Guardian's been really good on play over the last few years. Yeah. Kate, um, we've are there any questions coming through on the chat? That um, a lot about um, how um, we can support parents and how there's a role for early education. And I, as a nursery teacher, can remember standing with new parents in the playground often um, as they um, were frantic as their child moved over the climbing equipment, mm -hmm. you know, desperate to rush in. But as we stood back and talked about it, they felt much more relaxed when they could see that their child was doing what they were capable of and then the little bit extra. And I think lots of people are saying that in the chat box, but how can we change, how can we support adults with their fear of risky play? Is there more we can do, Suzanne wanted to know? And somebody was talking about anxious parents and allowing the children to be independent especially with all the health and safety rules. I think in Scotland, we're quite lucky that um, the Care Commission are into um, risky play. Mm -hmm. um, and then a question about, do girls need more encouragement to take risks? Which I think is very interesting. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and maybe Helen, you could talk a bit about your survey that you did and yeah. what the different results from Scotland and England. Because I think yeah. people will be really interested in that. Sorry. And that's yeah. most of the questions at the moment. Mm. I was going to um, draw on the survey results actually to answer some of the questions. So I'll start by saying a little bit about it and then I'll answer the question about parent anxiety. Um, so we ran a survey of nearly 1,000 parents um, and every sort of group in terms of ethnicity and age of parents and socioeconomic backgrounds and things should be represented um so it's not just kind of that we put something on Facebook and got some data and everybody's the same like it's quite a diverse sample um and so a couple of findings that Scotland came out really well on um one was we asked what age children were allowed in um in Scotland that was nine point nine and a half essentially um and that was lower than everywhere else, all regions of England and Wales, um, by at least a year um, and almost two years in some places. Um, so children in Scotland are going out much earlier <laughs> than they are in other places. Um, they're also doing more outdoor play than almost all other regions in terms of the number of hours that they're, that they're playing outdoors. Um, so things are better in Scotland than they are in England, but most of you who are in Scotland probably <laughs> already know that. Um, and then, so another thing that I wanted to mention, so as part of the survey, so that the main kind of survey findings have been published over the sh last week, week before. Um, but we have all, we also ask parents what gets in the way and what helps them to allow their children to take risks when they play. Um, and one of my students has been working on that and we're hoping to have that paper ready soon, but just to kind of give you a, a little um, taste of that. What comes out really strongly, and actually I have somebody else who's working with teachers, and I think there's, there's parallels across, which is that most of the adults we speak to are able to say that they know this type of play is good for children. And they can talk about the things that they'll learn and it's beneficial for them and it's important that they learn how to take risks. But then they talk about the, what gets in the way and what gets in the way, one of the number one things is their own anxiety and that they worry that something will happen to their child or to a child that they're supervising. And so when, if we're thinking about what we do about this, telling parents that this is really good for kids is probably not going to be hugely helpful because actually they already know that it's good for kids. And telling parents they should be doing something that they're not doing just increases their anxiety. Um, so actually what we need to do is think about how do we reduce anxiety? And as I said, when I was speaking before, to reduce anxiety, we need to prevent avoidance. So schemes like the Roam programme are brilliant for that because it gives parents an opportunity to give their child a taster of independence and them a taster of that anxiety of not, not taking care of their child, which is the first step. 
Mm. You know, so whenever we're facing something that we're scared of, what makes us feel anxious, the best way to do it is a little bit at a time. You know, that's intuitive. We all know mm-hmm. that. Um, and so having that first separation, the first time that your child goes out and is by themselves, that's when your anxiety is going to be the highest. But why not? If they could go somewhere like that, where you know where they're going, and then the next time maybe, you know, they go somewhere else where there aren't going to be any adults and you just kind of build it up. And that will help parents to cope. But if we go from your child has never been out, now we expect you to let them walk down the road, catch the bus into town, spend the whole day in town with their mates and then come back. Like, obviously that's going to be terrifying. So I think it's a little bit at a time, but it's about getting over that initial hurdle. And I think often, I mean, the, in England, children are almost 11 by the time they're allowed out by themselves. And what I think is happening there is parents realise they can't avoid it anymore because when they go to secondary school, they have to go by themselves. Um, so suddenly they let them out, which is not what kids need. Right? They need to very gradually be allowed out. And I remember, you know, we were allowed to play on the street outside our house. And then we were allowed to go down the road to the house that had the purple garage. And then we were allowed another block, you know, and that gradually built up, which meant that when we you know, were able to catch a bus by ourselves, whatever, we were ready to do that rather than straight in to right off you go, you're now by yourself. Because I think it's those initial baby steps of, of, in, of having schemes and things where children can have that independence. And also, um, as, as, as we were just hearing from Kate, um, if teachers are doing it or educators are doing it and saying, why don't we just step back? And lots of the teachers that our research has talked to shows that they can recognise that actually when they step back, it's really scary for them, but then they see what the kids can do. And, it, and it's really eye-opening for them. So in terms of that training, it's about why, I know this is hard for you. I know you want to jump in, but why don't we just stand and watch for a minute and see what happens? So. Yeah, one of the things that Kate and I can never understand is why primary education um, courses, until recently, they may be changing, but hardly anything on child development. Um, it's all about curriculum and it's all about literacy and numeracy and all those sorts of things. Um, and most of the teachers we've talked to who've gone recently through primary training did not get anything more than, you know, the odd lecture here or there on child development. And yet it's absolutely vital that you have some understanding of the, the sorts of physical, social, emotional, you know, experiences that they need in order to make it. And I think this for me is another reason why this idea of a kindergarten stage, which would for for the UK be an enormous step, really, um, thinking about um, a a sort of Nordic style approach until children are seven, um, would be a really great way of starting to change the culture because the people working there, their major would be child development, play-based pedagogy, and outdoor education, and getting the children outdoors. So that those things we could start sort of easing parents into understanding. Interestingly, so many parents, like the ones that answered you, they, they know it. And when they see it starting to happen, that yeah, that, that looks right. So Kate, you, you're muted. There's the amazing film of the um, Danish kindergarten and the parents discussing their um, fears about uh, there's a huge pond right beside it and they're using knives and they're climbing tiny, tiny trees. And um, the parents discuss their fears and how nervous they were to begin with, but how they've seen their children blossom. So, you know, it's experience, isn't it? Somebody wants to know how their risk-averse eight-year-old who's full of anxiety can be encouraged to uh, walk home three minutes from school on his own or her own. Any ideas? I just made a friend. A friend, that's what I said, a friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My poor poor child um, had to walk through Edinburgh as I was a single parent and when she was young because the uh, mother who took her to school decided that her child was ready. I don't think I was ready but there wasn't really an option. And then later on, I discovered that they went on numerous different routes, 
went to pick people up, but luckily I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> and they survived and came out as very independent girls. So, you know, go for it. <laughs> yeah, a friend is a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's more in the chat box. Um, well, well, well actually, actually, can we can we get back to one question that was raised earlier about gender? Because I think that's interesting too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does. Suzanne, when I was doing work can, on a book, Suzanne, on, sorry, can I just say Suzanne says an attachment object with the child yeah. as well, yeah, which yeah. is interesting. Yeah, mm. something in your pocket. I always think makes you feel much braver. Mm. Mm. Yeah, mm. sorry, but I, I mean. Back to, back to the gender thing, I, I was um, really interested in the, in the extent to which girls seem to be so much more socially aware and pick up the social signals from grown-ups, which mean that they're, it's easier to sort of get them to behave at school and things like that. Um, and so they're therefore becoming more risk averse because they don't want to upset the grown-ups a lot of the time. Mm. Um, but is, is I mean you're the child psychologist. Tell me about it. What's what's the gender implications on risk aversion? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think just I'm, I want to tell you the truth. I think that um, there's some indication that the gender differences might be getting smaller in terms of risk taking. Um, there's a question about how much of it is you know. Sort of biological and how much is that we treat girls and boys differently um so from our data mum mums and dads tell us that girls and boys play equally as adventurously um and what i'm not sure about is whether they perceive what they perceive a girl's adventurous play to be to be the same as what they perceive a boy's adventurous play to be of course um, but I think often we make more of gender differences than there is actually there. Um, and because it's almost like, you know, it's just that we buy into that stereotype and that idea, don't we? But I'm not sure that the gender differences are huge. Um, there is evidence of observing children playing on playgrounds that, that, that girls and boys approach risk taking differently, that they end up in the same place in terms of how much risk they take. So I think I'm right in saying isn't like girls think about it for longer before they do it, but they still spend the same amount of time taking the risks, um, you know, but I'm always a bit reluctant to kind of make some generalization that's that broad, like half the world's population are female. <laughs> There's no way that they could all be the same. You know? um, so I think it's what's much more important is that we think about individual children and what they need, as Carol said earlier, in terms of being responsive as parents, but also as educators, I think, with anybody who's interacting with children, that some children, and this has also been mentioned in chat, some children will be naturally sensation seekers, risk takers, and actually what they need from an adult is slightly reining in, right? Yeah. And what other children need is some gentle encouragement to give it a go. Mm. What the majority do is step back and let them get on with it. Mm. Um, but it's, it, so I don't think it's about whether it's a girl or it's a boy, but it's about what that, where's that individual child at and what do they need from the adults who are around them? Yeah. Can I, I, I mean, I, I see in the chat box, I mean, saying it's, it's always a, a good approach not to generalise, but I'm, I'm going to ask you a question, if I may, because you started with those very startling figures about the rise of anxiety. Mm. Why do you think that is? Is it the lack of play? Or are there other social and cultural factors? What, what would you attribute okay. it to? Very much my opinion. <laughs> um, my opinion is that part of it is that is exactly what we've been talking about, that we're not preparing children for what life throws at them because we keep them too safe. Um, mm -hmm. And we also have taken away quite a lot of their time for free play. Mm -hmm. And then we put an awful lot of very structured assessed educational goals onto them from a very young age. Um, I personally don't think that the way that our education system is currently set up aligns with what children need. Um, I also think that because as you were talking about how you know that the sort of effects of our own childhoods affects how we are, you know, adult anxiety is 
Mm. They're being raised by anxious adults more than they ever have been before. Yeah. So it's not just about our kids, but it's about the people that are raising the kids. The teachers are more anxious. The parents are more anxious. Mm-hmm. Um, so in order to help prevent child anxiety, we need to also think about how we support adults with their mm-hmm. own anxiety. Yeah. Um, you know, the number one predictor of anxiety and anxiety disorder over time is having a mum who's anxious. Mm-hmm. Um, so it isn't a surprise to me that, you know, we've got a sort of crisis in adult mental health that then plays out in, yeah. in child mental health. And we're seeing that being put down. Um, so I don't think, you know, it's not any one thing, but I think we don't, my general feeling is that we don't currently, our children are not growing up in a world that is, that meets their needs as best it might. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, Scandinavian countries have got that better. Children are spending more time outside, more time in nature, they're more physically active, they're able to explore, they're able to be more independent. Um, but I think, yeah, also a factor is that parents are anxious and that's not about parent blaming, right? I am no, a parent, no. parent blaming doesn't get any of us anywhere. But it is about thinking, how do we support everybody to be doing this and, and I think as I've already said a big part of that parent anxiety is this idea that we should be some kind of perfect parent <laughs> and this professionalization or industrialization of parenting and I saw somebody had written you know we don't we don't have daughtering or cousining or sistering yeah, yeah. yeah. my mum said to me when my first child was about 18 months old parenting was never a verb um and, and it really s- struck me, you know, she was just like, well, I, I was a parent, but I wasn't actively really doing anything. Whereas now it's, yeah, so wow, uh, we must do all this stuff. And, and so we're anxious. And if we're anxious, our children will be anxious. Yeah. So does that answer your question? And yeah, even, worse than the, does. even worse than the parenting books were the parenting television programs, which I think actually terrified the life out of endless people. I know. Just the whole judgmental um approaches of so many of them ghastly and sorry i just needed to get that off my chest carol you're about to say something well, i was going to say i mean when i used to do i mean i was asked by quite a few schools to go in and do i mean a much longer version of what i did with parents because they said we can't say these things to the parents but you could and actually i think for the most of the parents i spoke to they saw it as an incredible relief it made them realise that this idea that you should be bringing your children up never to have a negative experience um, or be unhappy was undoable, but actually it wasn't good for the children. And it, and it actually made it like, I mean, whether they went away and forgot about it, I don't know. But it seemed to be that rather than feel criticised and judged, they felt that they were getting rid of this enormous shackle that they had, you know. Um, that's really interesting I think yeah and I've definitely just had conversations with people about it and and seeing how all of these things are connected that if we give children more autonomy and more time to play freely then as parents our exhaustion levels go down because we're not trying to entertain the kids the whole time yeah yeah. um and you know and everybody benefits from it but if yeah. we try and entertain our children the entire time whilst working as, as women more than we ever have before, like everybody's exhausted. Yeah. You know, and they're throwing a pandemic and, you know, <laughs> no, one's, no one's doing well right now. <laughs> so, um, so the chat box is full of things about all the increased hours for childcare and how this will um, affect how parents perceive their ability to be parents if we're going to institutionalize childcare, childhood. Mm. So there, that, that's another book group. I think, I think actually it is another book group. I, and I, I do think it's interesting that, you know, in Finland they have long hours in childcare, but um, it doesn't, it, it, in terms of the, the daycare centers, some children are there for quite a long time, um, but it doesn't seem to have that same Year, that is an institutionalization and I think that, again a, a lot of that depends upon the way we view um, care and education <laughs> um, and the and the respect levels of the respect we give to the people who are caring for children under the age of seven and, and working with them 
we've got a we've got a long way to go still. But I do think um, you know Scotland's a little bit further along the the, the road than than England. I, I cannot. We've got to the end of the time. Can't believe it. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you both very very much. Um, thank you very much, Carol, for for uh, su suggesting that we do it. And for all the, 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 the your beautiful presentation, challenging presentation, and um, well, Helen, um, thank you for, for joining us as a guest. It's been splendid. <laughs> so um, look forward, everybody, to seeing you for the next one, which I, I think we have penciled in for the eighteenth, and that's going to be equality and diversity and inclusion. Don't, we've not got a proper title for it yet. But all being well, we'll get on with that. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, the, re the recording hopefully will be available and we'll have all the, the bits that went wrong cut out. <laughs> right. OK. <laughs> thanks. Bye. Oh, right.